You're listening to The Blueprint, brought to you by Executive Platforms. In every episode, we will discuss the topics and trends, the issues and ideas, the challenges and opportunities facing senior business leaders today. This series is one more way we want to engage with our network of industry executives. Thanks for joining us. Hello again, everyone. You're listening to another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint Podcast Series. My name is Jeff Mix. I'm Executive Platform's Head of Content and Research. My guest today is Cynthia Kaiser, a Deputy Assistant Director with the FBI's Cyber Division, where she leads the FBI's Cyber Threat Intelligence, Cyber Policy, and Cyber Partner Engagement efforts. Cynthia has covered cyber, technology, and counterintelligence issues for almost 20 years for the FBI, serving as a PDB briefer in two presidential administrations, and has led FBI cyber threat analysis and served as the FBI election lead since 2017. In these roles, she has reshaped FBI information sharing and collaboration with the private sector and federal, state, and local government officials to be robust, proactive, and aimed at imposing risks and consequences on malicious cyber actors. Cynthia is also passionate about increasing diversity in cyber and tech professions. She has been named a Woman Tech Leader Ambassador by GovCIO in 2022, a Top Government Tech Leader to Watch by Washington Exec in 2023, and received Cyber Guild's Warrior Award in 2023. She holds a Master's Degree in Security Policy focused on science and technology and an Executive Master's Degree in Leadership. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Before we get too far into things, I wonder if we can give our audience a little more about the FBI's cyber division. Most of our audience are in leadership positions at large organizations. What would you want everyone to understand about what the cyber division does at the start of our conversation? Thanks for this question. And the FBI cyber division is focused on imposing costs on our cyber adversaries. That emphasizes disruption, partnerships, and a shared responsibility for making it harder and more painful for hackers to succeed. And Really, what this amounts to is removing threats from U.S. networks, pulling back the cloak of anonymity that these actors hide behind, and hitting cyber criminals where it hurts, their wallets and the shared services that they use to conduct their attacks. But overall, assisting victims is our top priority. Everything we do in FBI Cyber Division comes from a victim-centric approach. Whether that's providing encryption keys when companies are held hostage by ransomware attacks or deploying our FBI cyber action team, our CAT team uh, for assistance, offering companies guidance on how to respond to inquiries during an incident, and even providing our services from our victim specialists when companies' employees feel the mental toll of their situation. The FBI stands ready to assist from beginning to end. For the chief information security officers and other executives listening, could you give us an overview of the evolving cyber landscape? Well, I don't think I have to tell anybody that cyber threats to the U.S. are increasing every day with an already crowded field of nation state and cyber criminal actors continuing to grow. And these threats are getting harder and harder to find. Malicious cyber actors have obtained an increasing capacity for stealth in recent years, demonstrating the ability to maintain persistent, undetected, and long-term access to U.S. networks, including critical infrastructure networks. Take, for example, the FBI's announcement a few weeks back about a huge disruption of a botnet used by People's Republic of China cyber actors known as Bolt Typhoon in the private sector. They've been targeting critical infrastructure for years using living off the land techniques uh, to blend into system activities naturally and help them re remain undetected and continue to lurk on our systems waiting for the right moment to strike. But still, no matter which actor we're talking about, these actors are getting onto U.S. networks initially because of easily guessed passwords, lack of multi-factor authentication, people clicking on links they shouldn't, and through vulnerabilities that have already long had patches available. I wonder if we could expand a little bit on the issue of leased infrastructure and botnet. Absolutely. I, these are evolutions that our actors are doing because they want to hide their tracks and they don't want us to know who's behind an attack. So take, for example, leased infrastructure. I, I'm not sure it's, it's commonly understood how easy it is for adversaries to rotate on and off leased infrastructure. And 
obscuring their preparations for attacks. And it's often just even unclear who exactly is leasing these servers because servers are easily overwritten um, and reused before we can even get a good handle on what an adversary may be trying to do. Kind of pause there. The separate issue of botnets is very interesting as well because what we see is adversaries are using this like rotating on and off leased infrastructure. However, they're also seeking to compromise large swaths of home and small business routers, maybe that are at the end of their life. Uh, so they're not getting patches or they had easy passwords to begin with and they haven't been, those passwords haven't been changed. But in the end, like they're able to take hundreds or thousands of these compromised routers and use them as operational infrastructure. So they're staging from this operational infrastructure, they're staging from these hundreds of thousands, hundreds or thousands of routers you could buy at your local big box store. And then they're looking to do their attacks from there because it hides who they are. It increases their ability to uh, and kind of power behind their ability to conduct these operations. And that's why the FBI has prioritized taking down this infrastructure. You've seen through multiple different operations throughout the last year, not just the People's Republic of China botnet uh, that I mentioned earlier, but also recently we've taken down a network of routers that were being used by the Russian military intelligence GRU. In the past, we've done that against other Russian uh, groups that are utilizing these just vast amounts of obscured systems to try to hide who they are. And I think what I hope everybody takes away from those actions is, is that even though our adversaries evolve, the FBI evolves as well. And we are able to not only um, find these actors from behind the networks that they think make them hidden, but do something about it and take away their tools so they can't harm Americans. I know you're giving a presentation this June at the North American Information Security Summit in Denver, and I understand attribution is one of the big topics you want to talk about. What are some of the key points you want to share with the audience? Well, I, I think about the cloak of anonymity that our adversaries hide behind a lot, not only because it's becoming more technically difficult to gain attribution, but because the decision making behind how we make that attribution is becoming more difficult as well. You know, when I first started working cyber, the process for attribution, it, it felt more straightforward. We would first respond to an incident while responding, we collect relevant information. After we collected what we could, then we would analyze that information, the technical artifacts, indicators of compromise, et cetera, and compare them with known adversary tactics. Then we decide how much detail we are going to attribute publicly. But nowadays, these steps are more complex. And they feel like they're almost happening at the same time. Changes in technology, the global landscape, the public expectations, net defender needs, and the cyber criminal ecosystem really itself have complicated established processes and given rise to some difficult questions, making us really rethink how we can most effectively approach cyber threats. You've already talked about the evolving cyber landscape and specifically about attribution. Can you also speak a little to the issue of risk management? Uh, while putting together the NACE series, we heard over and over again that if everything is critical, then nothing is critical. Uh, what advice do you have for cybersecurity professionals who are trying to prioritize where to spend their time and resources? One of the biggest challenges we face every day is the continued lack of cybersecurity basics implemented across U.S. networks. Um, if our networks all used more secure verification, multi-factor authentication, and automatically patched for vulnerabilities, our adversaries would be forced to spend millions of dollars and hundreds and hundreds of hours to make very specialized tools to be able to conduct their activities and conduct intrusions into U.S. networks. And those long, expensive, malicious efforts, they, um, they'd be in vain once we were able to actually publicly attribute them again. But right now, with the ad landscape as it is, our adversaries don't have to spend that, those dollars. They don't have to spend that time. They can go in through these really easy mechanisms. And that's where we're encouraging all net, refender, net defenders to be able to put their resources towards cyber hygiene and making software and devices secure by design is 
just so important for our future, not only because it makes it more difficult for our adversaries to compromise networks, but it also makes it easier for the U.S. and our allies to take away our adversaries' tools and capabilities. We've covered a lot in this conversation. If there were one or two key takeaways you wanted people to think about further, what would you want to highlight for them? Please work with, inform, and strengthen your relationships with your local FBI field offices. One of the greatest resources that the FBI has is our forward deployed workforce that allows us to reach victims across the country, no matter where you are. And we want to make sure that potential entities that are targeted know exactly who to call before a cyber incident actually occurs, because the quicker we're able to engage, the better we're able to bring intelligence to help you identify malicious activity and share what the actors have been doing elsewhere that can help your company figure out what to do next. So as part of that, we'd like to ensure that each organization has an incident response plan, and we're happy to help with writing those, um, but specifically to write in FBI engagement into that plan. The more engaging the FBI does in the wake of a cyber intrusion becomes really that industry standard, the more victims will come forward and the intelligence we'll have at their disposal will help assist them further. And then in the event you do suffer a compromise, please report to the FBI as soon as possible. Aside from the obvious that this like helps a, a targeted entity with remediating their system, it also helps us help others. We can't tell others about a threat unless we hear from you, and we can't tell you about threats unless we hear from others. So... Building on that, for people who do want to learn more, ask a few questions, uh, work with the FBI, what is the best way to do that? What's the best way to get in touch? First, best way is to identify and contact your local field office, and we have that list available at FBI.gov. You can also report compromises and obtain access to either our public service announcements or our Net Defender products at ic3.gov. And then finally, we're on LinkedIn. And you can find us um, from FBI Cyber Division on LinkedIn. Well, I encourage everyone who might have some questions of their own after listening to this episode to please reach out. And for those of you who will be joining us at the North American Information Security Summit in Denver, Cynthia's presentation will be on June 17th. It's going to be a great session, so be sure to attend. Cynthia, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in June. You've been listening to another episode of Executive Platform's Blueprint podcast series. I've been Jeff Nix. Let's do it again soon.